All right, it's one o'clock. Let's get started. Hope you all had a good holiday. Seems like, for me at least, it's been forever since we've been here. Um, so we'll probably get a little sluggish, uh, slow start here. Uh, last time, the main takeaway was, well, after we did a couple of related rate word problems, we've, we were doing derivatives of exponential and log functions. So this was, this is a summary of how you take derivatives of exponential stuff and this is the summary of how you take derivative of log stuff. Now, if you did your homework, then you got some serious practice with this. And I also told you you could write these formulas down on your formula sheets, right? So I will address any questions that you might have over homework. I'd be happy to go over any problems if you'd like. Um, but today what we're going to do is we're going to transition into the next section and we're going to be looking at uh, trig functions from pre-cal and talk about their derivatives. All right, oops, hold on a second. I should let you all know that, um, dang it, hold on a second. My uh, wife is about to get on a um, Okay, so any questions over homework for exponential and log? Like working it out? Yeah. Is there one you'd like me to do? Yes. Okay, which one? Do you have it written down? Yes. Okay, let me just copy it from you. I have the book right there, but uh, let me, uh, yeah, I'll erase this. What number was it? Uh, 13. 13? Okay, so it's number 13. And let me take a look real quick here. Oh, my. Okay, so it's natural log in the numerator 2y plus one. plus 1 all to the fifth, yes. and then over root of y squared plus 1. one. Alright, so we're supposed to find the derivative of this. Mm -hmm. Now, there's two ways to do this problem. There's the hard way, and then there's the easier way, alright? The hard way is just to go directly to the rules that we learned last class and just start cranking away this derivative. So I'm going to show it to you the hard way and then I'm going to show it to you the easier way after that. So the hard way would be, all right, let's take our derivative. So the derivative of this, there's a lot going on here. This, the first thing we have is composition. We have natural log of something, right? So I've got this idea of natural log of something and I'm trying to take its derivative according to the formula, this should be 1 over that something times the derivative of the something, right? That's the formula from last class. So I would do 1 over the something. The something here is 2y plus 1, that to the fifth, then all of that over the square root of y squared plus 1, right? That's just the very beginning step of the derivative. That would get flipped. I'll flip it in a little while times, now I have to take derivative of what's in here, right? And that is a quotient rule. So I have to apply the quotient rule to that, which is going to be really not fun, right? So let me try it. For the quotient rule, I have my top function and bottom function. I have my top function, that's my f, and this is my g right here on the bottom. And according to the quotient rule, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something here. It's going to be the derivative of the top, right? I take derivative of the f. That's chain rule, right? To take derivative of f. So it's going to be 5, 2y plus 1 to the fourth. That's a derivative, pulling the 5 out, all of this to the fourth. 
And then still within the chain rule, I have to take derivative of what's inside of here, which would be what? Two. Two, right? That's the derivative of the top. Now, chain, uh, quotient rule times the bottom. The bottom is the square root of y squared plus one. Then minus, so let me just kind of show you again. This right here, all of that is f prime. This part is my g, right? Now I'm gonna do g prime. Well, the, the bottom, g, to take derivative of that, I do chain rule again, right? Because it's a square root of something. So derivative of the square root of something, I am gonna have to erase this. Sorry, I can put that back up there. So I'm gonna have uh, derivative square root of something is one over two roots of that something times the derivative of what was inside, which is two y. That right there is g prime. And then times f. Don't forget, I'm finishing off the quotient rule here. So 2y plus 1 to the fifth power. That right there is our f. Y'all see this is, a, this is a mess, isn't it? All over the bottom squared. So when I take this bottom g and I square it, I get y squared plus 1. And that is my raw derivative. As ugly as it looks, right? That is my raw derivative. Give me just a second. Make sure that, yeah, okay. Um, and then I can start trying to clean that up, right? And cleaning that up would be not fun, all right? So I'm gonna leave that as that for right now. I'm, now I'm gonna show you the easier way to do this. The easier way to do this would be, um, can I erase? Yeah, I'll just erase this first part right here. Yeah, on the next test, the raw derivative would be okay. I'll even say on the test, just give me the raw derivative. All right, the easier way would be to go back, and let me just rewrite it. And remember we went over all those properties of logarithms last class? All these different properties from college algebra? If I start using those properties, I can clean this up before I take the derivative, all right? So I'm not doing derivatives here, I'm just doing properties. So um, there's a property that says that if we have, I don't think I want to bring up the notes again, but if we have division inside of a log, we can split into two logs with subtraction. So I can turn this into natural log of 2y plus 1 to the fifth minus natural log of the square root of y squared plus 1. Do you all see that's just the property of logs? Then there's another property of logs that says that if I have something to a power, right, inside of a log, if I, have not, if I have a log of something to a power, the power can come out, right? And this right here is actually what power? Instead of the square root, I can look at that as what? One half power, right, instead of a square root. And so I'm gonna pull the five out and I'm gonna pull the one half out. So I get five natural log two y plus one Right, and then I have minus one half natural log of y squared plus one. Wait a minute, hold on. Yeah, y squared plus one. Please understand there, I have not done, done any calculus, right? That is just properties of logs. This is much better than what we had before if I want to take a derivative, because I can do derivative of each one separately, can't I? So I'm gonna do that now. All right, I'm ready for my derivative. Here it comes. So if I do this derivative here, the five comes for the ride. The derivative of natural log of something is one over whatever was in there, times now the derivative of what's there, which is two. See that? And then the next one, I bring the minus one half, just bring it for the ride. And then here, the derivative of natural log of something is one over it times the derivative of what was inside 2y. And that's my raw derivative. Now I can clean some stuff up, but isn't that much better than what we had before? They are the same answer, okay? They are the same answer. You just have to algebraically prove that to yourself. Uh, maybe give you a final answer here. I would put, here I'd put the five and two together, make it a 10, put it on top. 
over 2y plus 1. And then over here, the half and the 2 go away. So I'll have minus, and on top I'll have this y that was here still up on top, and then over y squared plus 1. And that's a pretty clean derivative. I mean, yeah, maybe you could get a common denominator, but that's pretty clean. Yes? Right here? Yeah. Yes, you could have, but then you're, you would have had a little bit different sort of chain rule happening, right? Because if I had to take derivative of this, I would have done 1 over whatever was there, right? 2y plus 1 to the fifth, right? Times, now I take derivative of this, 5 times 2y plus 1 to the fourth, that's the power coming out, and then times the derivative of what's inside, which is 2. And then you see that, you know, four of those factors cancel. So you could have, but you're kind of doing more work. If you use the property of logs, it's just a little bit cleaner. All right, good, good question. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, let's go ahead and move on. No quiz today. We'll do that on Tuesday, all right? So on Tuesday, anything that we did last time, anything that we do today is valid. So I'll, I'll put the notes up for this section in a minute. I'm just going to get us going with it. So remember that in pre-cal, right, in pre-cal we learn the six trig functions. Uh, the, the, the cotangent x. Okay. Those are the six trig functions you learn in pre-cal, right? Sine, cosine, and then we learn tangent is just sine divided by cosine. Then we learn cosecant is one over sine. Secants one over cosine, so on and so forth. Yes? Are we on uh, doing 3.6? Yeah, it's 3.6. Uh, yeah, it is. Technically, we are starting this. I just haven't brought up the notes. Uh, 3.5, sorry, 3.5. All right, so we learned these six trig functions, right, in pre-cal? And then we also learn in pre-cal that each of those functions has an inverse. Basically a function that undoes that function, right? Yes? Now, when we do inverses, we have some domain restrictions because we know that in pre-cal, like for the sine function, if you graph sine, it passes the vertical line test, so it is a function, but it fails the horizontal line test, so it doesn't have an inverse unless we restrict the domain. So in pre-cal, what we do for the sine, I'm just talking about sine here, is we restrict it between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And if we restrict our, our sine function, that's like from here to here. If we just look at it in this little window, then in that little window, it passes both the vertical and horizontal line test. And so we can define an inverse for this function as this function, so long as we restrict the domain. Is that kind of, I mean, I'm not expecting for you to remember every little detail, but I just want you to remember that there are domain restrictions for each of these and they are, they are not the same for each one, right? So it only makes sense to talk about these if we're within certain domain restrictions on these. All right, so what are we doing today? Well, we already know the derivatives of all these, right? The calculus that we've learned is, you know, if we take the derivative of this function, we get cosine, right? If we take derivative of cosine, we get negative sine. And then if we take derivative of tangent, we get secant squared, right? And then there's three more that you can look up on your formula sheets, right? They're there. What we have not discussed is what the derivatives of these are, right? I mean, we have six other functions from pre-cal. These should all be able to have slopes of tangent lines, which means we should be able to find their derivatives. So that's what we're going to do here for the first part of today, is we're going to see if we can find out what the der derivatives of each of these are. What I'm going to do is I'm going to prove maybe one or two of these. I'm going to prove them to you. Then once I prove them to you, then I'm just going to point you to the formula sheet. All right? So I want you to see at least where the first one comes from. So let's try and figure this out. Let's find y prime. All right? And what I'm telling you is that y is equal to the inverse sine of x. So I'm asking you, hey, what's the derivative of inverse sine? Right? That's what I'm asking you. Right now, you have no idea, right? You could go cheat and you could look at your cheat sheet and tell me, right? But right now, let's act like we don't have that, right? 
So how do we figure out this derivative? Well, here's how we do it, right? The, the reason why what I'm about to show you is important, even though you're going to ultimately be able to go to your, your reference sheets. What I'm showing you, part of the procedure of what I do here is actually very important in Cal 2, all right? So you'll see, when I, I'll point it out when I get to it. <clears throat> all right, so what I'm going to do right now is, since I know nothing about this, right? I, know not, I don't know what that derivative is. I'm going, to use, I'm going to do the one thing I do know, and that is that if I take sine on both sides of the equation, did you hear what I said? Sign on both sides. Remember we talked about at the end of class? That, so this is what I'm referring to. I'm saying I'm taking sine. Technically, I'm not. So if we take sine on both sides like this, right? Then on the left side, we get sine of y. But on the right side, when you put sine and its inverse together, they kill each other off. That's the whole idea of an inverse function. So these two kill each other off, and I just get x. Do you all agree with that? Yes? OK. Now, the reason I did that is because I do know something about sine, right? I do know something about sine. I know that its derivative is what? Cosine, right? So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to differentiate both sides of the equation with respect to x. So this is like an implicit differentiation. I'm going to take derivative with respect to x on the left, and I'm going to take the derivative with respect to x on the right. Remember, we're trying to find y prime, right? y prime is really dy dx. Don't forget that. For us in this class, d y prime stands for dy dx. So I'm trying to find dy dx. I have this equation. I, di I differentiate implicitly with respect to x. Let's do the right side first. What's the right side? 1, right? Derivative of x with respect to x is 1. On the left-hand side, we have the derivative with respect to x of sine of y, right? So what's the derivative of, so of sine of anything? Cosine of, of that anything, right? So cosine of y, but I'm not done. Times, now I take derivative of the y with respect to x, and that's dy dx, isn't it? So we get that dy dx to pop out. Agreed? And now dy dx is what we're trying to find, right? So let's get it by itself. Um, let me just divide both, both sides by cosine of y. So I get dy dx equals 1 divided by cosine y. And that means dy dx is just secant y. See, right, because 1 over cosine, 1 divided by cosine is secant? Yes? OK. All right. So here's the problem. This is, right now it looks like we're done, right? Looks like we have an answer. But here's the problem. Our original function, right, y equals sine inverse of x, the independent variable here is x, right? It, it's kind of like this. If I ask you right now, hey, everyone, you know, what's the derivative of x squared with respect to x? Hopefully everyone says 2x, right? Do you notice that your answer has x in it? Your original function had x. Your answer has x. Here, I said, what's the derivative of inverse sine of x? And your answer has what in it? Why? Which is, it's okay, it's not wrong, but it means I need to know what y is to answer the question. It would be nice if I, if I had it in terms of x because, remember, when you're trying to find the slope of a tangent line, you go to some x value, go up to the graph, and you find the slope, right? So the x value dictates where you are on the, on the function, not the y value. So I need to see if there's a way that I can get this back in terms of x. You understand the issue? I want this in terms of x. I want this in terms of x. All right, this is the part in Cal 2, all right, that becomes important, all right? What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to create what is called a reference, a reference triangle. I'm just going to put ref triangle like that. I'm creating what's called a reference triangle. And what this triangle is going to do is it's going to help me figure out what secant of y is in terms of x. So if it's the first time you're seeing this, it's, it's not going to make a lot of sense until I start doing it. What I do is I go back 
to where I did my inverse on both sides, I go back to that first equation I had right here. Sine of y equals x, right there. And I'm going to write that down over here. Now, sine, by definition, remember the whole Sokotoa thing? Right, the Sokotoa from pre-cal? Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write now sine of y equals x over 1. And the reason I turn the x, o x into x over 1 is because now I want you to realize that this x we can look at as a fraction, where the hypotenuse is x and the 1 is the, I'm um, uh, sorry, opposite, sorry, I said that wrong opposite over hypotenuse, so the x is the opposite side and the 1 is the hypotenuse, right? And now I'm going to draw a triangle for you. And this is our reference triangle. It's going to be a right triangle where the opposite side is x and the hypotenuse is 1 and the angle in here is y. See if that makes sense to you. Sine of the angle y equals opposite over hypotenuse. Sokotoa, right? So, opposite over hypotenuse. Do you all agree that that triangle that I just drew matches this equation? This is a visual representation of that equation, right? You want to see it? So, by having that visual representation of that equation, what is it that we're trying to find? Secant of y, right? Secant of y. Well, secant would involve what two sides of a triangle? Hypotenuse and adjacent, right? Because secant's just cosine flipped over, right? Secant is, is uh, cosine flipped over. So if cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, secant would be hypotenuse over adjacent. Hypotenuse over adjacent, I don't know the adjacent side, do I? But, but, this side, whatever it is, I know I have Pythagorean don't I? I have Pythagorean. So let's call this side A for, for adjacent. Using the Pythagorean, I know that A squared plus X squared must equal 1 squared. That's our good old Pythagorean identity. And I can solve this for A. A squared equals 1 minus X squared. All I did there was squared the 1 and then brought the X squared to the other side. And then I'll take the square root. And when I take the square root, I'm supposed to do plus or minus, right? Plus or minus. But I'm only going to take the positive answer because the adjacent side here is assumed to be a positive number. So we're going to get 1 minus x squared. Do you need the square? Pardon me? Do you need the square? Yes, because this is subtraction. You can't do the square root of each one. Only if it was multiplication. So now I know what the adjacent side is, right? The adjacent side is square root of 1 minus x squared. And now I can tell you anything you want to know about any trick function of y. You, know, you want to know what sine of y is? I can tell you sine of y. I can tell you cosine of y. I can tell you tangent of y. I can tell you any trig function of y because I have the entire triangle. So we want to know what secant of y is, coming back to this. Secant of y is, remember, it's, it's hypotenuse over adjacent, right? Hypotenuse over adjacent. Not adjacent over hypotenuse, hypotenuse over adjacent. So it would be what for us? 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared. That is the derivative. And if you look in your formula sheets, you will see these below the six trig functions, the derivatives for sine, cosine, tangent, right? Do you see it there for, can I look? Yeah, it's a... Uh, Formula 19 on reference page 5. Formula 19. Do you all see that it shows there that the derivative inverse sine of x is uh, 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared? Mm -hmm. That's where it comes from. Yes? When you were doing the reference Yes. Why did you do x over 1? Why did I do x over 1? Yeah. Because when I think about sine, go back to the Sokotoa, right? This idea is that sine is always the opposite over hypotenuse. So x by itself, I don't see that as a ratio unless I write it like this. And then I could say, okay, that side would have to be the opposite and this side would have to be the hypotenuse. And that's why I labeled this opposite x in the hypotenuse 1. If I leave it as this, then you don't really see it as a ratio. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, that's it. That's how we prove what the derivative of inverse sine is. 
Let's do another one, okay? I'm gonna do another one. Let's do one that's not so, well, they're, they're all the same, but let me do one that um, I normally don't do. Let's do a cotangent inverse of x. Let's find the derivative of this. This reference triangle is the Cal 2 thing you'll need, all right? In fact, in my Cal 2 class, very first day, I, I go over reference triangle. Just real quick, we go over it because you, ne you need it. <clears throat> all right, here we go. I want to know what is the derivative of cotan engine inverse of x. Do you see the answer there? What formula is it? Uh, yeah, do you see it? Yes. Negative 1 over 1 plus x squared. That's the answer. But let's see where that comes from. So first thing I'm going to do, was that a question? No, is that a prime? Oh, that's supposed to be a minus 1. Sorry, I don't know why I didn't put minus 1. All right, first thing I'm going to do is take cotangent on both sides of that equation because I don't know anything about the derivative of this. So I'm going to take cotangent y and then cotangent of cotangent inverse of x. The left side is cotangent y. The right side is just x by the property of inverses. So just applying the cotangent function to both sides of the equation. Now I differentiate with respect to x again. So I take derivative with respect to x of cotangent y equals the derivative with respect to x of x. Hey, the right side's 1 again. Great. Now we need the derivative of cotangent y. So you may not remember this because it's not a common one that we do a lot, but the derivative of cotangent according to your formula is negative cosecant squared, right? So it's going to be negative cosecant squared y, not x, times now the derivative of a y, dy dx, right? And now we divide both sides by negative cosecant squared of y. So dy dx equals uh, 1 over negative cosecant squared y. What is that? What is that really? That's sine Negative sine squared y. So here's one way you can look at it. You can look at this as negative 1 over cosecant squared y. You can look at it that way. They put the negative out front. And then you could look at that as negative 1 over cosecant y, but then all of that squared. Because if you square this, right, you square the top, you get 1. If I square the bottom, I get this. But by definition, 1 over cosecant 1 over cosecant is sine. The reciprocal of cosecant is sine. So this is just sine of y, but then squared. Right? This goes back again to like pre-cal stuff. So this is really just negative sine squared y. And I have a problem again. It's in terms of y, right? Not in terms of x. So I'd like to get it in terms of x. And to get it in terms of x, I'll need a reference triangle. And that reference triangle is going to come from right here. Right there. It'll be a different triangle. Yep, it'll be based upon that information right there. Okay, here's my reference triangle. I start with the information I have, which is cotangent of y equals x. I'm going to turn the x into a fraction, x over 1. And now I need to remember what cotangent is. Tangent is, yes? What allows us to make the assumption that this triangle is a right triangle? No, there, there's nothing that says that I had to use a right triangle. It's, it's, what I'm doing is I'm saying, with this equation, I can draw a triangle that would match what that equation is saying, right? So it's not that I'm given a right to do it. It's, it's ignore, ignore this, OK? Ignore this. Just completely act like that wasn't here. If I told you that I had a right triangle, 
and I told you this angle was Y, and then I labeled um, this side X and this side 1, and then I asked you right now, what's cotangent of Y, what would you tell me? Forget that. Just if I ask you what cotangent of Y is off this triangle, what would you say? X over 1, right? So do you agree that from this triangle I could write that equation? Yes. We're doing it the other way around. I'm saying here's the equation, let's draw a triangle that matches that equation. That make sense? Now, why is cotangent, I, I put x here and 1 here, y. Cotangent of y is the reciprocal of tangent, isn't it? And tangent is opposite over hypotenuse, so cotangent is hypotenuse, oh wait, sorry. Tangent is opposite over adjacent, right? Tangent is opposite over adjacent, so the reciprocal of that would be adjacent over opposite. So I'm going to, hold on. I'm going to label this. This is going to be the adjacent side over the opposite. Now, what if you forget opposite, adjacent, hypotenuse? What if you forget all that Sokotoa stuff? Is it on your formula sheet? Does it say it anywhere on your formula sheet? Which side's which side? Yep, right there, reference page two, top left corner, right triangle trigonometry. It says sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse, right? All six trig functions are there, right? Okay, your question. Yes, because we can't use that information like Sokoto, we can't use it if it's not a right triangle. Y'all good? What are we interested in? Sine, right? Sine of y. And then we're going to square that answer, but what's sine of y? Well, according to this triangle, sine of y, sine is uh, opposite over hypotenuse, right? Opposite over hypotenuse. So I need to know what the hypotenuse of that triangle is. So let's call that hypotenuse, let's call it h, right? Let's go figure out what h is. Using Pythagorean, I know that x squared plus 1 squared must equal h squared. And that's just x squared plus 1 on the left equals h squared. And I want to know what h is, so I take square root on both sides. And when I take the square root, I have to do plus or minus, right? But again, I'm only doing the positive because it's the hypotenuse of a right triangle, so it's going to be a positive number. And now I have the whole triangle, don't I? Well, I should say I have the whole triangle at least in terms of x, right, or numbers. And that allows me to go back here and rewrite this sign. Now I'm ready to come back and put my answer. I have negative, okay, what did we say sine of y was? opposite over hypotenuse, but then what am I supposed to do with that? Square it. Square it, right? I'm taking the sine of the y and then squaring it. There's sine of y and then square it. When you square that, the, the root on the bottom goes away, doesn't it? And so you're just left with negative out front, 1 over the root went away, x squared plus 1, which matches exactly what's on the formula sheet, right? Yeah. 